Okay, I just wanted to put up a little bit of data, um, which I find always salutary. We had some a lot early in the morning, but lately not so much. Um, so I already showed this in the very first talk of our um, workshop here, but not in the conference. This is the old plot from Larson's paper uh, showing this line width sigma up there versus on the x-axis, the size. And he interpreted this as uh, due to turbulence. Um, and I wanted to show you some other plots uh, which show deviations from this because this goes back to this question about, you know, what is driving the turbulence, okay? Um, in this case, right, whatever's driving the turbulence, if you interpret that as turbulence, it's got to be on a scale of, of order 100 parsecs, which sounds like the scale height of, anyway, the molecular disk. This is all molecular data, I should say, it's CO data. Um, okay. But then a lot of other people noted this is from the uh, Castanelli Myers in the 90s, if I remember correctly, where what they said was that if you look at, you know, low mass star forming regions, low mass cores, not necessarily with stars in them, that more or less followed Larson's law. And I think that solid line was um, more or less consistent with Larson's original line. Again, this is, um, this only goes up to 10 parsecs and down to a, a hundredth of a parsec. Uh, but they noted that in <clears throat> massive cores that the line width was substantially higher, okay? And in fact, that that, um, that dashed horizontal line there is, is the sound speed roughly in this molecular gas. So it doesn't actually get down to the sonic length, okay? And there's more recent data which shows the same thing. Again, this is radius not going as, to such a small scale, but the velocity is up there in dispersion. And this includes... Starless cores, mid-infrared dark cores, these are things that don't have any feedback. What's that? What's your reference data? Um, I didn't write it down, sorry. I'll have to go look it up. Okay. It's a, uh, uh, forget the guy's name. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, this is more recent. Um, so, uh, First of all, you can see the slope on this is no longer a half or anything like that. It's a lot smaller, a lot lower. And just the, the magnitude of it is higher than you'd get from Larson's law. And it's all supersonic. Okay. Again, this is molecular gas. Um, There's another result. This is showing the same sort of thing. This isn't um, as a function of scale, but as a function of distance from the galactic center. Again, this is CO measurements. And the line width at large radii is about three kilometers a second, and it's flat, independent of the distance from the galactic center. Again, remember, this is all molecular gas. There's not an awful lot of molecular gas out here at 15 and 20 kiloparsecs, but it's there. You can measure it, okay? And then as you come in, you start to see the increase in the, in the line width. It, there's sort of a peak at around four kiloparsecs, which is what people call the three or four or five kiloparsec ring, which is where the peak in the star formation is. There's a little bit of a dip, and then it goes back in up as you go right towards the galactic center. Okay. Um, we can talk about what the interpretation of all this is. I mean, the simple thing to say is that out here, um, there's not much star formation. And as you go in, you get a lot more star formation. That's the star formation feedback driving some of the turbulence. This is an accretion disk, so there is energy available. You could drive it just from turbulence through the accretion disk. And on the inside, of course, there is a bar which will also stir up the gas. Now, whether you want to call those motions as turbulence or not, that's another question. But there is, just in terms of the measured line width, indications that there are different things that produce different types of turbulence. Um, I think I'll skip that one. Okay, so that's just to sort of get the discussion started. There was a lot of discussion earlier. Maybe I'll close this off and look that up, I guess. I don't know if anybody wants to write up there. Um, uh, we did have quite a discussion about, um, well, one is, you know, what drives the turbulence. And um, I would make the point, I was just talking to Jim Stone, who was making the point to me. A lot of the simulations that you see are stirred turbulence in a box where you somehow stir it by hand, okay? And, of course, different people stir it differently. Sometimes it's slow and oil stirring. Sometimes it's compressive. Sometimes it's some combination. Um, you know, the reality is there's probably different things causing the turbulence at different places in the galaxy or on different scales. Even though we tend to think of it as, you know, cascade from some large scale down to some small scale, there are obviously deviations from that. And I think we should be very aware of that. That's why looking at data is always helpful, right? We, we 
like paying, we're all somewhat obsessed with power laws. They're very attractive to the human mind, I think, uh, because they're so simple. But reality isn't usually like that. Yeah, got to go ahead. Yeah, um, since there are no actual representatives for the uh, global hierarchical collapse uh, scenario here, I'll bang that drum, which is that a lot of what we're calling turbulence may actually be accretion and collapse in a high Reynolds number medium, which of course is turbulent because it's a high Reynolds number medium. You can't avoid it. But it's not a dynamically uniform pressure the way Chandrasekhar might have imagined it or the way Larson even imagined it. And rather, we're looking at the consequences of gravitational collapse rather than the um, opposition to gravitational collapse. And I, you didn't show Heyer's plot, but that's kind of implied by your plot of massive versus low mass uh, cores. Um, and again, their gravity is controlling it um, one way or another. And um, whoever was talking about that, maybe, I don't remember. Um, whoever last put up Larson's Law um, said, well, this could be varial um, uh, balance, but Varial balance is only square root of two from free fall. So if you have collapse, it'll look almost virial to within 40%. And if you tell me that we know these numbers to within 40%, I'll go either try to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge or have you talk to an observer. No, I think that's, that's accurate. I would say in most um, CO clouds, by number, they're definitely not virial. The real parameter is way higher than one or two, it's more like 10 or 20 or 30. So they're not gravitationally bound objects. So they're not gravitationally collapsing. They're, they should be exploding, or they actually are exploding is one way to rephrase it. They're just stuff that came together and is flying apart. Okay, so. Uh, yes, yes. Well, that's actually, the better thing is probably something like if you go look today or yesterday, the big swell was hitting, right? and at high tide it was bouncing off the walls, uh, the wall of the, the cliff. Um, so that's your reflecting barrier. Yeah. Uh, and you get a nice reaction when the backwash hits the wave coming in. So yeah, you get a lot of behavior like that. And you know, if you took a power spectrum of that, it wouldn't surprise me if you said, oh, that's turbulence. Well, if you ever step into that place where that happens, you'll sure as hell feel like it's turbulence. I can tell you from experience, yeah. So I have a question. I want to dig into something you said. Uh, you had said that those motions were were supersonic. Yes. But are they super authentic? I mean, I, I imagine that you know those line widths are dominated by the denser regions, which are probably colder, whereas there might be warmer medium in this multi-phase ISM that has higher velocities. And so I, I, I'm just curious, just from the point of view of of, of theory, like. Supersonic motions don't necessarily mean it's super authentic, and that changes the whole dynamics of how the turbulence is going to evolve. No, I totally agree with that. And most of these measurements don't have, well, for the sum of the clouds, you have magnetic field measurements. Mostly they look, they're probably transalphanic, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With big error bars. Is, <laughs> yeah, right. I thought there was going to be more controversy from the earlier talks, yeah. Well, if you want to talk, come up here. So, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, come up to the mic there. Don't be bashful. Yeah, that we should emit uh, remote capture. Nevertheless, it's not clear that uh, the remote capture is not clear. Uh, yeah, I'm not hearing you very well either. Or maybe just come closer to the mic. Okay. I, I don't think it's on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no? Yes. Oh. <laughs> now let me step a little bit now. <laughs> okay, fine. I think we should uh, be a bit more careful what we call uh, turbulence and what we don't call turbulence. Turbulence has a particular definition. It's a cascade of energy. And uh, if you have a random um, uh, collection of uh, objects with uh, uh, broadening, it may not be turbulent at all. This is uh, one thing. Another thing is uh, 
that I believe to go uh, to, we should go to more detailed studies compared to this uh, rough uh, measurements of the Larson law, because uh, Larson law is uh, a very crude approximation, and uh, we had uh, today talks which showed that uh, Molecular clouds are not uh, nice uh, um, uh, roundish objects for which you can say, oh, I measured the dispersion and therefore I know what is uh, the velocity. So they are much more complicated objects. I think uh, we need to go to the more detailed studies using, for example, a, what is used in turbulence, for example, structure function. And uh, there was a recent paper led by Cajó where there were uh, studies of uh, uh, this uh, turbulence motions at different scales for both the uh, diffuse media and uh, uh, CO and uh, Kaho, was it also uh, denser uh, 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 Yeah, yeah. The, and uh, they uh, corresponded to a great power law, which is much more convincing than the usually referred to Armstrong power law, because Armstrong power law is just density, but this is velocity, and it uh, goes, uh, shows that we have a big uh, uh, power law uh, in which molecular clouds are just uh, uh, subsets of a big, uh, um, um, you know, um, system of uh, uh, the uh, turbulence. So I think uh, moving to more detailed uh, studies, we can say much more compared to the traditional uh, dispersions and we will be much more quantitative and we will be able to compare to uh, the uh, uh, theory. But to do this, we need to take into account the modern advances. Uh, and again, Kaho did a big uh, contribution on that, uh, 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 developing a technique of uh, removing, uh, for example, density fluctuations uh, uh, from the uh, spectral lines. And uh, because of that, we have a way to compare apples and apples and oranges and oranges. Otherwise, uh, with uh, um, using uh, spectral broadening, we are maybe very much affected also by densities. If you're doing structure functions, which people certainly do in these papers as well, you get you get similar type scaling laws. So it's not like this is not a... Uh, no, I just it's, it's said well, that, well that we need to remove uh, uh, density from velocities. Density in super uh, supersonic turbulence uh, have completely different spectrum from uh, velocity. And uh, sure. unless we remove this, it's a uh, mess. So go ahead. You had a... Uh, yeah. Um... I guess I wanted to go back to your question of the drivers of turbulence. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that, yes, we study this, um, you know, uh, we do the simulations by steering the box. Um, and so, right, so based also on what we have seen today, um, I was wondering if, you know, you're kind of constraining yourself to the, to the paradigm of uh, homogeneous turbulence. but. You know, um, for example, I study solar wind, okay? And so in the solar wind, you cannot prescind the, the fact that uh, you have an inhomogeneity, that the solar wind is an expanding medium. And I guess, I mean, we have seen bubbles earlier. And so you have these things that expand or accrete. And so, um, you know, these properties uh, at the very large scales of the system can act as a driver um, because, well, we also haven't talked about other than waves, which I uh, love so much. Um, well, in one talk, we saw other than waves. Um, and, uh, and so, right, so, so one of the, you know, one of the ideas is that well, to have turbulence, uh, uh, at least incompressible turbulence, 
you need this, uh, you know, counter-propagating waves. That's a requirement. Otherwise, you don't have the turbulent cascade. Um, and so, for example, inhomogeneity is a way to introduce reflection, so you can reflect. I mean, it's natural to think that you have these event waves, um, and then they get reflected by inhomogeneity, and that helps to trigger um, the, the turbulent cascade. Um, so, I mean, is there a reason why we, I mean, uh, is there a reason why uh, maybe uh, large scale gradients can be neglected or? or uh, I would say no, there's not. Be? It's just they're neglected because typically uh, people start off with the simplest possible ideas and, they're, and they don't consider harder ones until they're forced to. So, um, that's, a, that's my take on what's going on. Right, I guess, all right. right. So the yeah. point I wanted to just highlight is that, uh, you know, uh, I believe that one should not proceed from large scale uh, inhomogeneities that can drive uh, the turbulence. Since Eve isn't leaping up at this point, I'll quote her as saying that she went and measured it and said the large scale gradients weren't as important as the supernova. Is that a fair paraphrase? It comes to the mic, or can someone give her a mic? Yeah, yeah. Here, give her that one. Eve, right here. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by large scale gradients exactly? I mean, what, what, what we measured, so what we measured is, you know, the stresses produced by gravity and compared to the energy input rate from. Okay, Super so, yeah, what I mean by large scale gradients, for example, um, all right, so in the solar wind you have, you know, a system size that's bigger than one astronomical unit, for example, okay? So that sets, um, you know, your typical uh, scale of the system, and then you have turbulence that develops within that. So, um, I mean, I'm no expert in uh, accretion disks or, uh, you know, other astrophysical systems, but I guess you have, like, you know, large scale shears, uh, you know, that are large scale, like larger than, you know, the, 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 the turbulent eddies. Yes, that's sense? true. So when we do lo local simulations, we include this as background shear. Okay. And uh, then in the local simulation, you can measure the gravitational stresses, and they are basically the, the rate of shear times an average value of the correlation of gx, gy. So, so that's the gravitational stress. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking about, but that is the measured quantity. No, it's not really a specific question. I guess once you include this, uh, you know, coupling of waves, uh, it's a smaller scale waves with larger scale gradients. Um, and let's say you do not steer uh, the turbulence artificial. Uh, it, it, it is certainly true that the that the interaction between you know you have expanding supernova remnants and the interaction of that with the shear is important. You know it's important for for turning. Um, okay, you know so as as was mentioned before, it's important for uh, you know that's a inverse cascade which is moving from small scales to large scales, but then you have a direct cascade of the um, essentially. You know that includes the shear that that is the shear part. So as you were saying, in the big question of what drives the turbulence, isn't it reasonable to think that automatically the fact that you have this large scale gradients, the system itself can drive um, the turbulent cascade by you know favoring, for example, reflection of waves that can you know help to to feed the turbulent cascade. Just... I mean, I think large scale shear is important. It's important for the dynamo also. Um, so, you know, it is important. I, I, I think everyone would agree. Right. Elliot, were you going to translate? Okay. Um, I think uh, it uh, also stresses the point that uh, Turbulence is not every random motion. Turbulence, uh, we have uh, two different things. 
we have uh, the issue of uh, injection. And this is uh, the previous uh, question is, there is an injection and it has uh, its own uh, properties. And there is also the properties of the turbulent cascade. If we want to do any theory, we need to talk about the cascade because it's only the cascade that has a self-similarity, has uh, the properties that we can uh, explain. And uh, it also shows that uh, the dispersions are very bad measure to characterize turbulence because they are uh, affected also by the injection, which uh, is not turbulence. This is a separate problem of injection. Well, I don't like artificial distinctions, and reality does include injection, and I'd rather not exclude it. I prefer reality to theory, in other words. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one of the points that comes to mind when you talk about uh, large-scale gradients, yeah, you said already one thing, that it could contribute to driving. Yeah, that uh, are indeed examples. Convection, for example, is an example. But that must uh, then, of course, require that the entropy gradient is really unstable. Uh, the other aspect that comes to mind is the correct analysis. If you have a system with large gradients, it does not make sense to, to measure things ac uh, across these gradients, of course. Uh, what you can only meaningfully do is measure uh, along the gradients where the system has comparable states. And that brings me maybe to the point that you raised in the beginning. You showed us uh, spectra, uh, you showed us uh, density uh, dispersions, velocity dispersions velocity. that were not at all related to the radii. Yes. And uh, so this looks completely crazy, of course. I mean, uh, if, if somebody takes data and max misses, mixes completely crazy things together, then you get crazy results. So what, what was going on in these cases? You probably know better than they were. Any, they were looking at clumps of different sizes to find the way observers define clumps typically, right? Usually with the contour of a, a line emission of some sort, uh, and then measuring the size that way. And then the line width, they just see a, in the line, they see a velocity dispersion. And that's what they're measuring. Did it make sense to you? It's an observed fact. For that size of an object, they saw that line width. That makes perfect sense. Whether it's turbulence or not, that's another question, right? Yeah. yeah. To raise the point that, the, in fact, uh, this is probably the single measurement that I know uh, that the, the driving scale for turbulence is from H1's uh, velocity spectrum measurement is about 150 parsec. So I would uh, be happy to hear if you and if you know like any other observational constraints on the um, energy driving scale of interstellar turbulence from observational data. Well, I think this comes back to my original point. I mean, there's more than one way to drive turbulence. Hmm. Sure, there could be a cascade coming down from yeah, 150 but, parsecs. There right. Maybe on so, smaller scale, some other form of driving of turbulence, which would give you a, a scatter in the size line width relation. That's not particularly surprising to me. Uh, I mean, it's not surprising, but I mean, the observation don't know what is the, really the driver behind it, but the direct measurements show there is some flattening of the velocity spectrum at, at 150 yeah. parsecs. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I agree. That's true. But that doesn't mean there's a flattening at a smaller scale. Right, yeah, yeah. But in the morning, I think uh, Mordecai I think, uh, mentioned there could be turbulence driver at kiloparsec. So it doesn't mean that if we use not H1, but some other tracer, we could get like something peaked at uh, kiloparsec. Well, so my I saw H1 data from. Yeah, yeah, sorry. The kiloparsec driving is from H1. Uh, this was Alma Green's uh, work right. like 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think there's been a recent study too from, um, I can't remember who led it, but it was from Germany and they did a whole map of the LMC and computed structure function, driving scales, and it was above the KPC for the LMC from H1. Do you recall the scale height of the, I mean the LMC sort of has a disk. Remember, do you recall the scale height of the disk? It's less than a kiloparsec is my recollection. Um, no, I can't remember. Um, but I also want to say that I've been trying to reconstruct blasts and laws with turbulent boxes recently, and I was talking about this with you, Norm, um, tracking 
high density filaments in 3D and then working out their internal velocity dispersions and trying to reconstruct the last law that way. And I don't reconstruct it, even though I have a turbulent cascade and presumably they live in it. Um, I can't reconstruct it with just high density clouds or high density filaments. So that's interesting. I mean, they're, they're just not perfect um, traces, traces of the cascade. In your case, what kind of thermodynamics do you have? This is just an isothermal. Yeah. I'd like to make, I, I have a question to weave, uh, because uh, in your simulations, very nice ones, you have um, uh, this photoionization effect, and you, uh, the results do suggest that photoionization is one of the driving sources of, of turbulence because it's comparable with the effects of the supernovae. In, in, in your maps, you show this one. Is, is, is this uh, yeah, is that, this statement? That's, that's not the case, no. Okay, I mean, so, it's, yeah. so the uh, photoionization is, is very important in destroying molecular clouds. So, right. mm -hmm. you know, if you look at, so, so that's the way that photoionization, which evaporates gas, mm -hmm. which leaves and, you know, also drives out neutral gas. So that's what's destroying molecular clouds. But that, if you, if you just look at how, how much turbulence do you get if you only have that? It's, it's less huh. than okay. you, it's significantly less than you would get, you right. know, from So I, I think I misunderstood your statement on, 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 on okay, on, on that effect, because then my question would be, if this is really, uh, might be a driving source, I would believe that it might be only very close enough from the source, not at, at larger and larger scales, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the um, it, it's, you know, that energy is lost very, very quickly. Right, yeah, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there, there, there would be the other question that I think it was posed by someone else about cosmic rays, because cosmic rays, they exert some kind of pressure and then you might have this as a, you know, a, a source of uh, turbulence, but again, it's, it's, it, it, it goes into the same path of supernova, uh, supernova injection of, of turbulence because they, they come together, right? It's uh, a byproduct yes, so, of... So, so for uh, cosmic rays, the, the thing is that the, you know, the most of the mass, of course, in the ISM is, is neutral, and the ion neutral damping rate is fast enough to make, you know, to damp out waves. Mm -hmm. And so the scattering rate is very low in the neutral gas, in the uh, ionized gas. So, so that basically means that the, the neutral gas is kind of transparent to cosmic rays. And right. so there's not pressure gradients that are, that have right. any significant in, in role. In for the thermal component. Okay, right. So, okay. and if I may, can I make a question to Dimitri? I mean, of course, this might change the subject a little bit the discussion. Okay. So, Dimitri, uh, you showed the, these nice results, on, I mean, corrections to Chandra Seca Fermi on a way to measure magnetic fields. But, and uh, of course, it's, it's easily to test. It's, uh, I think it's doable to test it through numerical simulations, right? So, uh, did you guys have performed the numerical simulations to test these corrections? Can you discuss or? Comment a little bit about this. Uh, yes. uh, well, yes, we did, and that was my reference to Kahovitz, where all his work was not found in my presentation. In that sense, so Kaho, <laughs> go ahead. So uh, we actually make a few different. Uh, uh, predictions in that particular paper. So let's remember that formula, B proportional to F times something. So we find out that that F depends on how the, uh, the modes are being distributed and what beta it is and how you look at the system. So we test a number of them. So a lump, one of the most interesting case for my interest is if you have a PYL thing mode that is being put on the sky, it will have like MA3. I really don't remember the number, you know, correct me. But if you look, if you have other modes, it will become MA to the power one, something like that. So it sounds to me that it, it is a way of measuring or detecting 
the fraction of moles that are on the interstellar media, which will be complementary to some of your discussions here. Greg, have a question or a comment? Yeah. Um, there we go. There go. Uh, I, want, I wanted to revisit the question you started with about the high mass clusters and the, and the velocities version. First, I wanted to ask you a question. You, you, you had pointed out that the, the line width in those high mass clusters was larger than it was in the low mass clusters, but it also looked like there was um, a different slope of that line. And I don't know, but I, I, you know, you put it up quick and I couldn't tell whether it was meaningful or whether it was just all shifted up. Was it the slope or just the amplitude line width that you were most concerned about in terms of comparing those two? Well, in the paper they remarked on both. And they claim, I mean, it's a, it was a, as was indicated here, it was a bit of a scatter plot, but when they tried to fit it, a slope to it, it was much flatter. Much flatter. Than Kolmogorov, yeah. Like but basically not quite zero, but nearly zero. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, just if, if you're concerned more about the amplitude, I mean, it, it, it may not be too surprising to have larger amplitudes and denser, denser media because if the density rises, if you have an alphane wave that's moving along, um, its speed is going to slow down, and conserving wave action, it's going to increase the amplitude taller. of those waves. Yeah. And so yeah. that's not too surprising. Now, if that's done in some kind of an interesting way with some kind of a, a, a particular mass function, plus you might also have some reflection of wave energy, I imagine it might be possible, although it would probably require some serious tuning, to, to give yourself sort of a slightly different different slope. But I mean, it wouldn't look exactly like that Kolmogorov slope that you expect. But, um, but certainly how, you know, and, and I think of all of this in terms of alphane waves. And so that's the reason why I asked the first question about whether things are subalphanic, because if, they're, if, if it's super alphanic, then, then this argument really breaks down. But if you have alphane waves propping it along, and they propagate into a denser region, they're going to concentrate that energy. And exactly how that manifests itself in terms of the observational consequences of what we see, something I don't think really has been addressed in the literature that I'm aware of, at least. So certainly, it's an avenue of exploration that one could consider in trying to explain these different uh, scalings of the velocity dispersion that you, that you pointed out. No, I agree. They're definitely higher density clumps. And uh, yes, if you have an alpha alien that propagates in and slows down because rho gets bigger, but B doesn't get equivalently bigger, it'll steepen. So that's one avenue to explore. The other thing to be aware of is these clumps are like big GMCs. They are self-gravitating. So that's the other thing that can also affect things. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to do simulations uh, of just you know, propagating alpha waves or turbulence, if you want to think of it that way, into these really dense clumps and seeing if you see that steepening effect, which you should. Action yeah. should be preserved, right? Yeah, right. Um, uh, so that would be an interesting thing to explore. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, go ahead, Christoph. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to re-emphasize your initial point, which was um, about the various different velocity dispersions and various different scales. I think considering that there are... It's on, he's just... Uh, sorry, a I can speak Move a bit slightly louder. closer. So considering say. that we have all these different drivers of turbulence on all sorts of different scales, so we have like this large scale accretion onto galaxy, it may or may not have enough energy, I don't know, uh, supernova explosions, MRI, jets on small scales, they probably don't reach the largest scales, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And considering that we have supersonic turbulence on some scales, subsonic turbulence on others, superalphanic, subalphanic, cooling. It's such a mess that I don't think we can expect there to be a super duper power law or cascade of in a classical turbulence sense. And I'm sometimes not sure when we say turbulence, we talk about the same thing. I think there's turbulence is not it's, there's different types of turbulence, let's put it that way, but I think classically we're talking about incompressible turbulence. Uh, that's, that's what the community would normally... Normally isotropic homogeneous. Isotropic right. homogeneous without gradients, but there's totally gradients and, and, and there's density fluctuations and I think that's what we're trying to understand, right? But that's right. I think a cascade that extends all the way, I think, I mean, there's work by even Mordecai, right, with Osenkopf, with Volker Osenkopf in 2002 that showed a pretty good power law over a very large range of scales. I think it goes beyond 100 parsec, even to kill almost. Well, as Mordecai noted, this is but, work by uh, Bruce Almagren or 
and there's both of the other ones, even if I remember. But right. there's yeah. a lot of scatter around that. So yeah. people show something, some measurement, but if one puts it all together, like the ones you showed, if we put them all together in a big plot, I think there would still be more or less something that says, okay, larger scales have larger velocity dispersion, smaller oh, yeah. scales have smaller velocity dispersions. But there's a huge amount of scatter around that, and I think there's a lot of processes in on all of those scales that can, like mechanisms and processes that can drive turbulence. So I guess there are cascades and turbulent flows, but the way they are, is not like the classical way of cascades necessarily. Plus when we have shocks, we jump these cascades to small scales suddenly. So I guess there's no theoretical solution to all of those problems yet. Mordecai. Desperately. I'll I agree that uh, Maclow and Os or Osikoff and Maclow did find, um, using wavelet transforms, some correlations that looked an awful lot like power laws over extended scales uh, in observations. Um, or actually, no, I guess those were in simulations that then were compared to Osikoff's observations. Um, but I want to add a, an additional complication to this point which there is that there are actually two ways to get a structure function uh, that behaves with a one-half power law. One of them is turbulence, and the other is self-gravity. This was, we showed this in Roxana Chira's paper in like 2017, that, so we looked at a box that kind of like Tigris, not as sophisticated, um, had both gravity and supernova driving. And we saw that the diffuse medium had a one half, and that was clearly turbulence because, you know, driven turbulence because there was nothing else going on there. But then the dense clouds where self-gravity is clearly dominant also had that, and they just match onto each other. You can't tell the difference. So Larson's law may be a bit of an illusion. I will start with a uh, joke. So uh, there's a one, once upon a time, Richard Lasso actually wrote a very long email to me regarding the paper that Alex was pointing out that we have like five orders of magnitude spectrum that we see from different kinds of data. And then he says that by the time I'm at 1980, I was claiming it's one half, it's not one third. I think we had that discussion during the time where we have BBQ. One thing that I think we have to be very careful when we're interpreting, interpreting data that we observe in the sky is that, you know, things are very complicated starting from 100 PSD, you know. Depending on whether you trust, you know, compressive driving or sonolite driving, depending on the evidences, they pass through phases, thermal instability, H1, H2 conversion, star formation, outflow, and then it comes to 10 to, two, 10 to negative 2 PSD. Despite all these, you know, physical effects and complications, we actually see observationally very clean, more or less, you know, law on the sky. Despite there are a lot of scatters, but they are all more or less okay. I think the question here right now should be defined this way: Why, despite the, you know, happen, you know happening of that amount of physical process, we still see a more or less okay power law that allows us to debate whether it is, you know five-third or three-half or negative two. That is actually a more defined question. It's probably gravity. That's the only thing that acts over all the scales. So maybe Mordecai is right. Go ahead. So although the MHC turbulence, uh, finding turbulence, the theory is, is, is uh, established based on the nonlinear interaction of alpha waves propagating opposite directions. But I, somehow I noticed that in astronomy, different from the space physics community or sto solar physics community, the people don't drive turbulence this way. Usually we just put all the energy in velocity and that perturb magnetic field. Uh, similar to how we drive hydrodynamic turbulence, but now with initial magnetic field, so you create magnetic fluctuations by driving turbulence in velocity. So, but I don't know, I mean, in solar wind, uh, people do argue about alpha waves, propagation of alpha waves, and that 
the wave interaction. I don't know, maybe the on smaller scales, these two different types of driving, no matter you put energy in turbulent velocity or put energy in alpha and waves would give you something similar. So which would be more realistic driving method in different contexts? Yeah, Alex. Would you, would you care to comment on that, Greg? <laughs> I'd be happy to comment on that. So, um, I, I mean, you know, if you're in a magnetized plasma, if you push the plasma with the with the velocity, it's gonna it's gonna stretch the magnetic field, and the restoring force is gonna immediately generate an alpha phase wave in doing that. Now, you can of course very carefully, comp you know, drive compressible turbulence. You won't, you'll drive one of the faster, slow magnetosonic wave modes doing that. I mean, the the way you know. If you, if you run kinetic simulations of turbulence, you cannot push the velocity, really, because you've got a bunch of particles everywhere. Uh, you, you can put in forces, and so what we, you know, the way we drive our simulations, which we've been doing for a long time, is we actually drive currents, external currents in the plasma that generate delta V perp. And that will very nicely generate a turbulent cascade if you put alphane waves going up and down the magnetic field counter-propagating and perpendicularly polarized, they will interact nonlinearly and generate a very beautiful cascade for you. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's it's a little bit like you, you really just can't do this with kinetic codes because you don't have control over the particles in the same way. I mean, the distribution will evolve because it's really the electromagnetic fields that are affecting their motion. And so unlike in MHD codes where you can really force the, the, the velocity, you can't do that in kinetic codes always run with, with driving magnetic fluctuations. And again, because kinetic codes are really limited to the small scales, I mean, we can't really drive the dri or simulate the driving scales, the real physical scales. So we typically tend to choose uh, fluctuation properties that are, are sort of appropriate for the middle of the inertial range. Um, with the appropriate anisotropies and so forth that correspond based on, you know, MHD scaling theories, either Goldorak Street R95 or Boulder 6 they're slightly different, but they're similar. Um, and we'll drive the simulations in that way, and that'll uh, generate a nice cascade. So we, we typically do this, um, and, and, then, and then we, you know, we see what happens from that point and see where the turbulence goes. I also want to add another question because in, when we put energy in velocity, we can do compressive driving, mixed driving, solenoidal driving. But if we directly put energy in magnetic fluctuations, and then, yeah, so that is a question like how much energy you put in faster waves or alpha waves and what to do with the interaction. Because if you only do the alpha component, there's not much energy going through alpha turbulence to the compressible component. So there's another issue. Well, it's been shown by uh, Shekhachin back in 2009 that in the in the in the range of scales that are larger than the ion armor radius, or what I would typically call the MHD regime. I mean, it's collisionless. Um, that the compressive fluctuations and the alphanic fluctuations don't exchange energy at all. So if you drive alphanic modes you get alpha, you know, incompressible energy. I mean, there are ways of very carefully knowing what the sort of the eigenfunctions in the collisionless plasma of, say, magnetosonic, slow magnetosonic modes are. You can drive those as well. That's a, a lot trickier to do, but it can be done, and people have done it. Um, so you can, you can do that, but those will not interact uh, nonlinearly as long as they're away from the, the true isotropic driving scales. If things are already anisotropic, those, those uh, cascades, uh, the alphane waves actually cascade the slow magnetosonic waves to small scales, but they don't exchange any energy. When they get to the ion armor radius scales, they in principle can because sort of the asymptotics where you prove that breaks down. Um, and, and that's still kind of an open question where, where it goes. I mean, Alex Shekhajon has showed in like 2019, I think, that at low beta, all of the compressible energy goes into heating the, the protons or the ions. Um, and, but what happens at higher beta and other cases, it's, it's not completely clear. So it means that uh, what turbulence we study quite sensitive to what type of driving we choose, right? So, sorry, Alex, you want to? Oh, just, uh, I don't want to spend uh, much of your time. First of all, uh, the relation between uh, transfer of the energy between uh, the um, 
uh, alphenic modes and other modes. In collisional media was shown not in 2019, but in uh, 2003, it was uh, 2002, it was uh, Jungian's paper with me. Uh, this is the first thing. And the second uh, thing is uh, that we have a recent paper which uh, shows uh, that uh, driving is uh, very much dependent on, uh, uh, determines the properties of the turbulence. And uh, um, it's uh, very much uh, changes uh, if we are driving magnetic field or we are um, uh, driving in the velocity. It uh, changes the distribution of um, uh, velocity and uh, um, uh, magnetic field uh, turbulence energy. Well, if you allow me to add a point, uh, I have to have to make a discriminator. This time I'm not you know, with Alex. Uh, there's actually another paper that is going to be published in Nature Astronomy that uh, is from a lady that shows how, how beautiful in solar wind, you know, we have the authentic cascades from weak to strong turbulence. So I think the, the issue is this, you know, while you have different kinds of driving which you can trigger whatever you want in the amateur scale, as Greg says, they more or less like, you know, work out independently, you know, and they still show some of the behavior, some synergy between uh, uh, on themselves as Alex was saying in 2002, some sort of scales as an HOP should be seen in that particular regime already. Anybody, any other? We can, we can stop early, right? That's a, an allowable thing. <laughs> yeah, I think we should, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>